Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir, I'm an assistant professor at the Zindal Global Law School. Welcome to the UGC's EPG Patshala project. Today we'll be looking at paper number 4 on civil and political rights and module number 21 of that paper which is the purpose of the prison system in India. Right. So Justice Krishna Iyer, a very well-known judge, once said that despite being convicted of a crime, prisoners still enjoy the same rights as free men. The purpose of this module is to set out what some of these rights are by making reference to the jurisprudence that has developed internationally on prisoners' rights. Essentially, this module helps you understand why we incarcerate people in the first place. Is it because we want to punish them or is it because we want to reform them? That is the fundamental question this module will seek to answer. The rights of prisoners in any system generally flows from the answer to the aforementioned question. What are the learning outcomes of this module? Well, after studying this module, the student will understand the rationale behind the prison system in India and have an appreciation for the different laws that enumerate the rights of prisoners in India. Right, so according to Salman, right, who's essentially a scholar of jurisprudence, the law may be defined as a body of principles recognized and applied by the state in the administration of justice. Law in its distinct forms is used by the state in order to administer justice so that peace and harmony can be maintained in society. Essentially, that is the view of Salman, right? So, the rule of justice, the rule of law actually determines the sphere or area of individual liberty in the pursuit of individual welfare and the main aim behind this is to confine the liberty of the individual which is consistent with the general welfare of the community, okay? So, According to Salman, another important ingredient of the state's function is the protection of the right of every individual while enforcing his corresponding duty. So essentially, in society, according to Salman, there are corresponding rights and corresponding duties. Uh, this is evident in our very own constitution, wherein you have fundamental rights and you have fundamental duties. Fundamental rights essentially enforceable in a court of law. Fundamental duties more in the sense of directives to the citizens, saying that as citizens of this country, as citizens of the Republic, of India, they have a duty essentially to carry out certain, you know, to uh, undertake certain duties in order to avail the benefit of the rights. Okay, that's at least Salman's reading of the situation, right? Might not be correct in a strictly legal sense, but Salman's reading is rights and duties are, do correspond with one another. So essentially, you have a right to be free. Well, if you have a right to be free, you also have a duty not to kill essentially, right? So, if you kill somebody, you give up your right to be free. That is what Salman is essentially trying to get at, okay? So, therefore, if an individual fails to carry out his so-called corresponding duty, right, or legally enforceable duty, then in that case, the state has got the authority to punish that individual, right? So, essentially, there are certain types of duties whereby you have to do something. For example, you have a duty to take care of uh, your children, perhaps, right? You have a duty, right? In certain jurisdictions, jurisdictions, it's a legal duty. You can be punished for, uh, for example, not sending your child to school, right? Uh, also, you have a right to not to be punished. You have a right to be free, right? So, you have to carry out certain duties. Sometimes you have to refrain from doing something and that is also couched as a duty in Salman's language. So essentially, if the individual fails to carry out his corresponding duty or legally enforceable duty, then in that case, the state has got the authority to punish that individual, basically, right? The concept of justice, right, is extremely old, right? It's as old as the as old as human society itself, right? What does the social nature of man determine, determine or demand? The social nature of man demands that he must live peacefully in society. While well, man lives peacefully in society, and when we say man, we use man in the extended sense of including women. Men and women must live, right, in a manner that's peaceful. While living so, right, men and women experience a conflict of interest and expects rightful conduct on part of the others, right? Essentially, you, you're a man and women, living, uh, a man and a woman who live in society, right? Let's say a husband and wife, right? They expect their neighbors, for example, not to cause a nuisance. They expect their neighbors not to trespass onto their land, essentially, right? So you expect a certain uh, sense of, let us say, uh, common values, shared values. There are certain things that are just considered wrong, right? For example, if you have a dog, right? It's understood that you will keep that dog chained or leashed or at least ensure that the dog is trained so that it doesn't go into your neighbor's yard, for example, right? Now, that cannot be legally enforced, but you do, there is a sort of social contract there, a social understanding that, you know, we must live in peace and harmony and we must also not encroach upon the personal space of others, right? That theory kind of gets extended into the theory of uh, in crime, for example, where people start in barging into other people's homes or people start, you know, as burglars who break in and enter, for example, right? Essentially, in scenarios, 
videos like that, right? What are you doing? You're essentially breaking your social sort of obligation not to intrude upon the personal space of others, basically. And when you do that, you give up your right to be free, right? This is why Salman says that though every man wants others to be righteous and just towards him, he himself being selfish may not be reciprocal in responding justly, essentially, right? So Salman essentially was looking at the nature of man. He said the nature of man is such that at times his liberty will have to be restricted because man himself is selfish and will carry out acts or will, uh, uh, you know, conduct will be such that it will endanger others or at least put others through some inconvenience, right? So essentially for Salman, that is why some kind of external force is necessary for maintaining an orderly society, right? So this is the key. There is a need for an external force right, for maintaining an orderly society, right. So, according to Salman, without justice, an orderly society is unthinkable. And how do you enforce justice, right, how do you enforce justice, right, essentially, right, and what kind of justice. So, at first, right, we have to understand what are the categories of justice before we even get into how we enforce justice, right. So, the concept of justice, right, essentially became more complicated, right, with the growth of the state. Now, in the present era, right, today we have civil justice, we have criminal justice, we have economic or social justice, and we have distributive justice, okay. So, what, what, is, what does all of that mean, right? In civil justice, what is civil justice? Anything that is not criminal. What is criminal? Anything that's not civil, right? That definition is sort of circular. But essentially, in criminal justice, the sanctions are penal in nature. The sanctions will usually lead to the deprivation of an individual's liberty or life in certain extreme cases where there is the death penalty. In civil justice, often the uh, nature of uh, damages, there's damages essentially, right? The sanctions are really monetary. So, for example, uh, let us take the tort of trespass, essentially, right? Trespass is a tort, which means trespass is uh, comes under the ambit of civil justice, but trespass also comes under the ambit of criminal justice, where you trespass onto someone's property, you're committing both a crime and a civil wrong. So, they can sue you and recover money for you from the damage you cause, and also they can seek your incarcerate Ration. So, there's civil justice, criminal justice, okay. There's also economic and social justice. So, you're probably wondering, well, where this module concerns the purpose of the prison system in India. So, why are we looking at even economic or social justice, right? Well, it's interesting because it's, let's put it this way, the more economically weaker sections of society, right, are essentially the ones that uh, found them find themselves incarcerated, right? It's very natural because economic deprivation is at the very core, right? Is at the very core of the cause for crime, essentially, right? So, social justice is justice, right? That's exercised within a society, particularly as it is applied to and among the various social classes of a society, essentially. And then you have distributive justice. Now, distributive justice again is economic in nature, unlike civil and criminal, which is legal in nature. Okay, so let's qu quickly look at some of the origins of the administration of justice, right? So, try to kind of divide it into four stages. Uh, you can go through the e-text. In the first stage, you know, it's essentially a society that was primitive, right? Private vengeance and self-help were the only remedies available to the wrong person against the wrongdoer, where the wrong person could not get his wrong redress with this, with the help, right, could get, rather get, get his wrong redress with the help of his friends and relatives. Now, you see this every day in India, right, this is what we call vigilante justice. Uh, you see people accused of rape or molestation sometimes being beaten up. You essentially see this in the context of school children nowadays, very common, almost every day in the news, uh, you see that parents take it upon, upon themselves to assault, you know, these alleged, alleged molester or alleged rapist. Now, what is the problem when you have this sort of uh, a system of uh, justice, if you will, justice? in its most uh, sort of primitive rudimentary form, vigilante justice is that, is that, you know, key to an orderly society that Salman refers to, you know, which we've uh, discussed earlier. Probably not, right? You can't have vigilante justice. You ha can't have people taking the law into their own hands. Essentially, people are emotional beings, right? Human beings are emotional. So, emotions will take over. If somebody, if your daughter comes to you and says a man has molested her, your immediate reaction would be that I want vengeance on this man for what he has done to my daughter, right? Of course, it's a natural sentiment. Who wouldn't, right? Who in their right mind would not want vengeance, right? But the state for an orderly society has to restrict that individual from getting his vengeance. Because why? What will, how will that individual get his vengeance? He will exact physical 
revenge, right? Essentially, he will go, he will beat up that person, even kill him perhaps, right? Or a mob could go and lynch that person, right? We don't know if that person has actually committed that crime. So, you know, in earlier modules, we've discussed things like right to fair trial, right to be presumed innocent, innocent, right? And essentially, administration of justice, if you have to be presumed innocent, there has to be essentially a state mechanism or a state machinery that has to enforce that presumption of innocence, right? And when there's vigilante justice, right, there is no court of law. Forget a kangaroo court. There is just no court. It is essentially the court of, let us say, public opinion, right, essentially. And there's not even a court of public opinion. This was the initial primary stage of the administration of justice, where individuals would take it upon themselves to exact revenge. Slowly, right, you moved on to the state coming into existence, right, essentially, right. And you had, you know, for example, you had the monarch, essentially, who would dispense justice in most countries, including India, right. Then you moved on right, essentially, to the payment of compensation by a wrongdoer to the victim, right. Thus, basically, till earlier, till actually very recently, right, they've remained, you know, the justice has remained sort of private in nature, where the state had no compulsive force, right. That is essentially the key here. The state had no compulsive force, essentially, right. So, we have to take out of this ambit things like, you know, you have panchayats, for example, and you might argue, well, panchayats have existed in this country for ages, but you can't, was the panchayat a state? I mean, even today you have examples in Haryana of the Kaap Panchayat, for example, dispensing justice, right? It's not just compulsive force, right? It's not just enforcement. The content of that justice is important, right? The content of that justice is very, very important, right? To administer justice, right, we have to arrive at a definition of justice, right? And what is that definition of justice? It's a definition that is given, right, that has to be agreed upon by the state. Why the state, essentially? Because the state has the organs, that is the legislature, the executive, the judiciary. The legislature and the executive, in India at least, are directly elected by the people, right? The legislature, the Lok Sabha, you're directly elected your representatives. Rajya Sabha, they are nominated, but again, they are nominated uh, by elected representatives, right? So the people get a say, and the people of the society together deliberate on what is the content of that justice, right? What is the punishment, right? So, for example, uh, we have section 302 of murder, we have punishment for murder. Punishment for murder is not public hanging, it's not death by shooting, right? Uh, the punishment for murder is hanging by the neck until the accused, until the, uh, de the convict is dead, essentially, right? The hanging takes place in private. There is no public hanging, right? There is no death by firing squad and things like that. That's because as a society, we've entered into a sort of, arena, uh, so there is a sort of tacit understanding now, even overt, you could say, that thing, cruel and unusual punishment has no place in a modern, democratic, civilized society governed by the rule of law, right? So basically, now we're in the stage of administration of justice, where the state exerts its, uh, sorry, exerts its authority, excuse me, where the state exerts its authority and takes it upon itself, right? Takes upon itself the responsibility of administering justice and punishing the wrongdoer, using its force whenever necessary. In this stage, right, with the current stage that we're in, there's a transformation of justice from the private sphere to the public. In other words, a wrong done against an individual is not considered wrong against that individual alone, but is actually considered a wrong against the state, right? back to our code of criminal procedure in India, you have cognizable offences and you have non-cognizable offences. What are cognizable offences? Essentially, cognizable offences, offences like murder and rape, right, they are considered offences against the state, right? So, if it's a cognizable offence, you don't need a warrant to arrest a a uh, suspected offender, essentially, right? It is a wrong against the state. For murder and rape, you don't need the uh, family of the victim, to come forward and prosecute. The state will take it upon itself to prosecute because they believe that let us say, uh, uh, let us say an individual, a girl has been raped, essentially, right? And her family forces that poor girl to enter into a compromise, right, with the man who raped her and forces her to marry him, right? Just because the two of them are now married doesn't mean, right, that the state does not have, cannot prosecute that husband for rape. If the woman who's married him might even say, look, I don't want to pursue this any further. It would be very difficult to pursue that case, right, essentially. Now, but the state has a duty. Essentially, the state has a duty. Now, again, you're asking yourself, what does all of this have to do with the prison system, right? Why does this have anything to do with the prison system? Because we're now coming to the issue of punishment, right? Now we have defined justice. We have looked at the administration of justice, okay? We've looked at the definition and how you define what is a crime and things like that. Today, how do we define what a crime is? We have parliament, right? In ancient India, essentially, right, you had things like the laws of Manu. Essentially, you had uh, religious scriptures that would essentially uh, sort of lay up, give the content, give a content to the justice, right? Now, 
the content of justice is determined by the deliberative procedures in parliament okay so we have decided murder right what is the punishment right in the olden times right in ancient india again the concept of sentencing was primarily based on the situation of the crime the causation what is the cause behind the crime right what caused that individual to sort of commit the crime and also the character and status of the offender in society right in ancient in, in ancient india right essentially what you had the caste system right the punishment varied according to the offender's caste or position in society for example the higher the position of a member in the society the more severe the punishment was right so obviously in a modern democratic society again this is not permissible right so what is permissible well for that we have to look at the theories of punishment what are the theories of punishment right so one such theory is the deterrence theory right or the deterrent theory what is that the theory is mainly based on the principle that the punishment should be of such a nature as to put a deterrent effect or a deterring effect on the offender and also on members of the society right the nirbhaya case is a classic example right uh, it is a horrid horrid crime so all of them have now been given the death sentence right so deterrent theory death sentence what can be greater deterrent than death itself so what is the message what is the message that the state wants to send out under the deterrent theory it says don't do this look this this guy committed rape or this guy committed murder look how we've punished him we've hanged him right does that really work in practice you have to ask yourself does it not really you know we've hanged recently we've hanged uh, ajmal kasab uh, afzal guru and just as i speak today uh, we've hanged yakub menon essentially we've executed yakub memon today right so does that mean it's a deterrence what does it deter yakub memon essentially came back right from pakistan some might say voluntarily some might say he was captured right he is considered the financial mastermind of the bombay blast yes the court has found him guilty undoubtedly one must respect the verdict of the court but the court has also given the death penalty why had the court given the death penalty because they made a determination that it fall, fell into the standard of rarest of the rare cases right now the court supreme court has no such power to strike down the death penalty well some say they do some say that the death penalty is unconstitutional but it's very difficult to make that argument right if the court was to strike down the death penalty they would essentially be uh, overreaching right they would be overreaching and they would be exceeding their mandate their constitutional mandate because their job is to interpret the law and not to make the law essentially right so the deterrent theory things like the death penalty life in prison are at the very core of the deterrent theory right the theory punishes the wrongdoer in such a manner that a message is given to the rest of the people through a warning that if you commit such an offense right or committed by the person being punished in that case you will be given the same punishment right it's due to this reason that the punishment is often given in public places so that the deterrent effect can be of great magnitude right so essentially you have open court right you have trial by open court we've gone through this in some of the earlier mod modules this is why you have trial in open court everything is transparent you can actually go and see that offender being punished and their hope is that the next time you have a temptation to kill somebody all right or you have some temptation to assault somebody or rape somebody or molest a woman uh you will think okay maybe i will get caught and maybe i'll be punished right so that is the deterrent theory does it work in practice my personal opinion if it matters at all is that it doesn't really i mean essentially how different are you from the criminals if essentially an eye for an eye as mahatma gandhi said will make the whole world blind right so the eye for an eye will make the whole world blind but the deterrent theory very much right is not per se based on the eye for eye eye for an eye theory that's the theory, retributive theory which will shortly come to but the deterrent theory you have to say essentially there's no other way right that retribution can be divorced from deterrence right essentially right so if you say deterrence right so uh, a, a strictly retributive theory would be what uh, an eye for an eye uh murder for murder right capital punishment is as retributive as it gets but what about other forms of deterrence right so you send somebody to life in prison right is that a deterrent part of the deterrent theory or is that part of the reformative theory it's interesting right so all these theories kind of overlap with one another but the deterrent theory the primary object of the deterrent theory is the punishment must be structured in such a manner that when this punishment is meted out other members of society will take note right and will also sort of send a warning to them that if you commit such a wrong you yourself could face such a punishment so that is the core of the deterrent theory right so now the deterrent right essentially first the punishment of the offender will stop the like, like will stop like minded persons from committing crimes in future that's what we've just dealt with right there's also right you can deter such a person from committing further crimes against society by physically preventing him from doing so right so there is an aspect of physical 
deprivation or the physical uh, curtailment of that of an individual's liberty, right? So, what is an important consideration of the deterrent theory? The evil doer, if you will, or the wrongdoer is made an example of and a warning to like-minded people is sent. The basic principle is to protect society from the criminal rather than reforming the criminal. Right. So, what is the basic uh, theory underlying the, the debt? What is the basic principle underlying the deterrent theory? Right. You protect society from the criminal. We are not concerned with the reformation of the criminal. Right. So, the deterrent theory can set can be said to be a self defense or a defense mechanism of the society against crimes committed by individuals. So, essentially, the deterrent theory is partially preventive because it aims at preventing the further commission of a crime after the crime has taken place already and not beforehand and due to this reason right the theory hasn't been that successful essentially uh, the deterrent theory still survives in the form of death penalty for murder and in the drastic penalties imposed for rape and other crimes which are pe peculiarly offensive to the moral sentiments and to the sense of security of the community so the deterrent theory as i've said survives and the death penalty is the classic example used for the deterrent theory Right. Uh, in the case of Pani Ban versus State of Gujarat, the court upheld the conviction of the mother-in-law for murder by way of bride burning. Yeah, obviously she burnt her daughter-in-law. The court contended that it would be unfair in this case if any, any sympathy would be shown when a cruel act like bride burning is committed. You know, in fact, in India, one area where the deterrent theory has actually worked is uh, crimes against women. Uh, if you notice now, plenty of families are very, very wary of, mil is, uh, mil uh, you know, sort of ill-treating uh, their uh, da the daughter-in-law, the woman who marries into the family, essentially. And in fact, now that's become a double-edged sword, whereby you also have some certain false cases under 498A. Uh, so, you know, you have this constant push and pull, where the deterrent theory and showing no sympathy, as they said in Pani Ben, my state of Gujarat, can also have another effect, essentially that uh, there is a, the presumption of innocence, essentially, is displaced. So, because you essentially have the entire family and the husband were immediately arrested. But at the same time, let's also not trivialize the fact that cases of, you know, harassment for dowry, dowry death, pride burning are rampant in this country. And that's one area where the deterrent theory really seems to have worked because the woman knows that the Indian state will step in and protect her the moment she makes a complaint. Right? But there are also criticisms of the de deterrent theory. Right? The criticisms are, look, there's no chance to the offender to reform to such an extent, right? Essentially, so that he can become a useful member of society. See, at the very core of the deterrent, so at the deterrent theory is that you will be prescribed of your, uh, you will be deprived of your liberty. Right? Now, if it's a reformist, right? If you want to reform, sorry, you want, if it's reformative in character and you want to reform the offender, Right at some, the point of the reformation would be his release someday, and his re the release of the offender is unthinkable under the deterrent theory. That's essentially the problem, right? And but yeah, essentially the deterrent theory does not meet the ends of justice as we've defined it, right? So if you want to give justice a more holistic sort of definition, other than simply an eye for an eye or a deterrence, the deterrent theory doesn't really seem to work. And again, it's all about vengeance, really, the deterrent theory, right? And the idea of reformation. Right, the, its idea of reformation, deterrent theory, is actually barbaric from its very disposition. Right, there is no reformation at all, actually. Right, where is uh, reformation? That's in the reformative theory. Right, the, now the retributive theory really flows from the deterrent theory. Right, you can't really divorce retribution from deterrence. How do you deter somebody from doing something by exacting retribution? Right. Let me just say that again. How do you deter some dis, deter somebody from doing, uh, from uh, committing a criminal wrong, right, an offence, is by exacting retribution. Essentially, because when you deprive somebody of their liberty, are you exacting retribution? Now, you might say not really. You're not exacting retribution because the death penalty for committing murder is retribution, right? But if you steal something, right? If you steal something, if you if you're con convicted of culpable homicide. Now, let's say Salman Khan has been convicted of culpable homicide. If you were to exact retribution on Salman Khan, the form of that retribution essentially would be what? You would make him sleep on a pavement and you would run over him with a car. Uh, see, that is retributive, right? So, but when you send him to prison for 10 years, that's a deterrent, right? You see, this it's a nuanced difference over there. The deterrent being that, look, even if you're Salman Khan, the law applies to you, basically, right? If you run people over, you know, and you're in an inebriated uh, state, basically, and you run people over, basically, right, you're in an inebriated state, you will be punished. Now, that's a deterrence, right? Now, if they run you over with a car, that's retributive in its purest form, right? Death penalty is that way, 
retributive because it's eye for an eye. Or even in Saudi Arabia, for example, you have things like, uh, uh, you know, in sur for certain crimes, you have things like, you have punishments like stoning and castration, uh, cutting off of hands and things like that. Now, that's retribution in its, in a brutal, you know, brutal and extreme form. That's retribution, essentially. See, anything that is retributive will also be deterrent. But anything that's a deterrent is not necessarily retributive, right? So, what's the position in India, right? The uh, retributive theory, the Supreme Court has applied the retributive theory while awarding capital punishment, right? In the rarest of the rare cases in order to justify retribution, the person causing injury. So again, in the case of Yakub Memon who was executed this morning, right? You basically have this situation where you say, okay, Yakub Memon was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people. Why? Because he financed the, uh, uh, you know, he essentially oversaw all the financial transactions, the moving around of the money across various jurisdictions. He was a qualified chartered accountant. And it's a rarest of the rare case, uh, the Bombay Blanc Blast. And uh, of course, it's going to be a deterrent if you sentence him to death, but it's also retributive, right? For many people, it's a matter of retribution in this country that Yaqub Memon has been hanged because the other mastermind suspected to be Dawood Ibrahim and uh, Yaqub Memon's brother Tiger, right, have not been captured and in all likelihood will never be captured. Right? So, essentially, it satisfies the instinct of retribution, the death penalty, as well as works as a deterrent to the like-minded to like-minded criminals. This was what the Supreme Court held in Jagmohan Singh versus State of Uttar Pradesh. Right? Now, the Law Commission has also suggested that time is not right to abolish the death penalty in various reports. And even as we speak here now in 2015, the Law Commission is considering this issue once again. Now, the Supreme Court in Surja Ram versus State of Rajasthan held that punishment must also respond to society's cry for justice against the criminal. So they essentially said, we must give in to this public sort of outcry or for justice, essentially, right? So now what are the criticisms of the retributive theory, right? The retributive theory is contrary to the modern way of penal methods and civilized way of life. Salmon says, again, the great jurist, that retribution in itself is not a remedy for the mischief of the offense by aggravation of it because it involves pain and suffering and is offensive to the considerations of humanity. Its approach towards the offender is vindictive and out of tune with the modern reformative concept of punishment essentially, right? So, retribution, I think its time has more or less come, right? But except for rarest of the rare cases, India has officially executed 58 people um, and many, many more are on death row. But how many of them will actually be executed remains to be seen. On uh, If the current average is to go by, uh, if you go by current averages, India has now been a republic, well, India has now been independent for 68 years and you've executed 58 people officially. Um, some people put the unofficial figures, uh, you know, they say are higher. We don't know. We have to go by official statistics. So, you're averaging less than one person a year. So, it they are sticking to the sort of rarest of the rare approach. So, Yaqub, Memon, Ajmal Kasab, Afzal Guru all came into that bracket of rare cases, uh, cases involving an attack on parliament, uh, attack on various uh, uh, sort of prominent landmarks in Bombay and of course, the Bombay Blast of 1993. Now, there's also the preventive theory right, to prevent the repetition of crime by disabling the offender via measures such as the death sentence, imprisonment, forfeiture. So, again, same punishments, right, you can give it a, whatever spin you choose to give it, right, preventive, retributive, deterrent. Really, when you think about it, right, what is it, what, which theory is actually different, right, it's the reformative theory, which we're going to come to shortly, right. Essentially, the end of all the penal laws is that they are not to be applied, yeah. So, when the land, when, when you, you own a land and you say trespassers will be prosecuted, why are you putting trespassers will be prosecuted? You're putting trespassers will be prosecuted there because you don't want anybody to trespass. Your hope is that it should not be applied. But it's a preventive theory there. It's a prevention. You say, look, if you trespass, you face consequences. So, we're putting in, we're saying, don't do it. Don't do it, you'll face punishment, right? And this preventive theory, right, essentially is considered right, a realistic and humane. But then again, you could say the Indian Penal Code is essentially preventive, right? It says Section 302 is murder. If you commit murder, you will be uh, sentenced to death. So, don't commit murder. Do people, don't, don't they commit murder still? They, of course, they commit murder. You sentence them to death, also they commit murder. So, what are the answers to this? Is it uh, the preventive theory? Is it the uh, retributive theory? Is it the theory of uh, deterrence? You don't really know, right? And Oliver Wendell Holmes, the famous American judge, said there can be no case in which the lawmaker makes certain conduct criminal without his thereby showing a wish or purpose to prevent that conduct. Obviously, right? That's exactly what I'm saying. Everything is preventive. At the end of the day, our penal laws are preventive. I mean, you can take preventive theory to such an extent, essentially, that you can 
classify certain people or you have habitual offenders in India and say, okay, this person is a habitual offender. Okay, so preventive theory will take them into custody, will keep depriving them, will keep arresting them, which happens in this country, right? You have certain tribes, for example, or considered criminal tribes and people there are targeted. So when you dabble in preventive theory, right, it is difficult. I mean, pre preventive theory can have extremes. Can you really prevent crime? Can you really prevent the commission of a crime? Right. At the end of the day, as Wendell Holmes said, the purpose is to prevent crime. How do you do it? Right. How do you do it? It would appear, right, again Salman said, that we hang murderers, not merely that we may put into the hearts of the others like them the fear of a like fate, but for the same reason for which we kill snakes, namely because they should be out of the world rather than being in it. A very, very sort of, uh, you know, raw way of putting it, right, comparing them to snakes and saying, why do you kill them? You kill them because... You don't want them to bite somebody else. You don't want them to kill somebody else, right? But really, what about, why don't you restrict them? Why don't you keep them in prison? Why don't you deprive them of their liberty? And while you're, right, uh, while you're at it, why don't you try reforming them, right? Essentially, right? Why don't you try reforming them? That is why the reformative theory, which we now come to essentially, right, is the only theory, right, that can prevent the commission of a crime perhaps you could say or you could accept the reformative theory essentially accepts that look crime will happen the reformative theory essentially accepts that look crime will take place all we can hope to do is to reduce the occurrence of crime and when individuals do commit crime we hope to reform them then we hope to send them out into society as functioning members and hope that they have a positive influence on like-minded individuals i mean let us be honest okay why, who are the, the majority of criminals in this country come from economic, right, impoverished backgrounds. And because we are a caste-based society, it's always from the lower caste. It's very, often, very, very rare that you find members of the upper caste committing crimes, right? Economics. Economics governs crime, essentially, right? So, you are essentially punishing these people twice over. They have already faced the fate of being born into a particular caste that is discriminated against. They've been born into a strata of society where they're discriminated against. They're in a very battle for survival from the very moment they're born. They turn to a life of crime. And then by applying either the deterrent theory or the retributive theory, when they commit that offense, you deprive them of their liberty essentially right when you deprive them of their liberty by all means do so you have to deprive them of their liberty you can't keep saying okay uh, uh, you know keep stealing or keep assaulting people or keep being a pickpocket right you can't keep saying that you have to deprive them of their liberty at some point but when you deprive them of their liberty what do you do when they're in your custody and in, in your they're under your control you have them in prison why not impart education? Yaqub Memon himself was said to be, had, think had done one degree and had enrolled himself in an MA in English in prison, right? Very well educated man who was a chartered accountant. Yes, he committed a grave wrong. He deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison. Did he deserve to die? That's the question you have to ask. Because the only theory that justifies his death is the retributive theory. If it was the reformative theory, he could have been, and some might say already was a reformed person. He was extremely popular in the Nagpur prison where he was housed. All the inmates essentially liked him. He would uh, teach them English, for example. Wasn't Yaakov Memon a force for good, essentially, in the uh, Nagpur prison? That's a question you have to ask yourself. Those are the questions that the reformative theory essentially grapples with right now this theory as compared to other theories actually brings about a positive change in the attitude of the offender so as to bring about a positive change right so that he can once again become a useful member of the society as a law-abiding citizen right it essentially condemns all form of corporal punishments the reformative theory right it looks into the future and not the past that is the beauty of the reformative theory the reformative theory well and truly has a solution unlike the other theories that you know, respond to a problem by creating another problem, essentially, right? So, it should therefore not be regarded as setting an old account but opening a new one. What are some of the important considerations? Well, the modern trend is in favor of the reformative theory, as you can tell from my views, but this method, right, should not be stretched too far. We've got to be careful, right? The reformative methods have proved to be useful in case of juveniles, first-time offenders and women, and in some cases, even some psych in uh, sex offenders seem to <coughs> excuse me, re respond favorably to the reformative method of punishment, right? But hardened criminals, habitual offenders, professional offenders, it's not, it's very difficult, right? Deterrence could just be the only solution. But 
maybe we combine elements of deterrence with reformation right right maybe yakub memon could never have been released again that that was out of the question but by keeping him alive we would have essentially said let us try and reform this person if not he's already if not you know him already being reformed how often does do an inmates have access to somebody who is a chartered accountant who is the mumbai police regarded as one of the most smart this is the smartest finance of the criminals that they have come across under mumbai underworld basically right so you have him who is a force for good there he's not is maybe reformed himself but he's helping other prisoners there it's a combination of deterrence and it's a and reformation you could even say retribution to an extent not retribution in the sense of an eye for an eye right and, but in the retribution in the sense he is deprived of his liberty for the rest of his life right essentially okay so you have to take into account time place and circumstances right so you have things like probation parole open prisons hostels vocal tra- you know you have vocational training you know education in the prisons etc etc okay so that brings us to the end of this module right the prison system in india to a large extent is based on primitive laws that are no longer in consonance with current human rights jurisprudence though some steps have been taken by legislature to fix this problem and courts have also given some direction to the movement by giving directions in its various judgments we have a long way to go before we reach the desired state wherein criminals are sent to prison for reformation and not to quench the thirst of a retributive society today that's an unfortunately a sad state of affairs